Hello everyone. I am so pleased and feel so very privileged to speak to you today about a subject that on the surface may sound boring, but I assure you that getting the timeline of the Bible right makes an enormous difference in how we understand the Old Testament stories of the Bible, specifically those from the book of Genesis. Plus, we will touch on a contemptible plot by the rabbis of the first and second centuries to cloud the testimony of the Old Testament, specifically that Jesus of Nazareth was the Messiah. These matters are tied together in a most unexpected way. The final analysis shows how Bible prophecy for the first coming of the Messiah was altered to hide the fact that Jesus was the Christ. But first, we're going to look at an example of just how much difference understanding the timelines makes in determining the truth in the Bible's witness. And make note, learning what really happened by knowing when things happened doesn't prove the Bible wrong, not at all. It proves our standard beliefs about these stories are not true. The Bible is the inspired Word of God. It is true. Well, let me give you just a couple of things about myself, especially uh, helpful, I hope, to those that, uh, that aren't that familiar with me. Um, I've been in business my career, almost all of my career, and um, I was professor recently of entrepreneurship at a major university. Um, a few years ago, I was awarded a master's in finance from Colorado State, and then I was awarded also, prior to that, a master's in theology from a, a southern seminary. Uh, written 20 books over 10 years. I've been the CEO, CFO, COO for numerous companies. And I've developed my website and the business around it, faithhappens.com. Now, some of you probably know me by this logo. Yep, you can find out about me on the internet by searching for Doomsday Doug. But we must begin with why we are looking at the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the oldest, most authentic version of the Hebrew Old Testament. To do this, let's take a quick look at Alexandria, Egypt. Of course, it was founded by Alexander the Great around 321 BC. Alexander laid out the blueprints for the city using white seeds on the beach. Just had to watch out for seagulls. Better scare away those birds so you can remember the blueprint Alexander laid out for us. That's what General Ptolemy probably said. Within 100 years, Alexandria became the largest city in the world. It was eventually eclipsed by Rome, but it continued as the second largest city for many more centuries. Alexandria lies just west of the Nile River Delta. Its most famous building was the massive library there, which housed the vast knowledge of the ancient world. However, unfortunately, most of it was lost during a fire started by Julius Caesar in his war with Pompey about 50 years before the birth of Jesus. The second most famous building was its lighthouse called Pharos, one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. It was second in height only to the pyramids of Giza. Alexandria is the most famous city we know so little about. For Christians, this means we are missing a massive amount of our history, and we are worse off for this lapse. It's vital to recognize that the Bible doesn't directly state the date of the flood, but supplies it through its Genesis 5 genealogy chronology. But if we turn to the chronology of the Septuagint, we get a reasonable date that fits with other events in Genesis 5-11 through 11 and beyond. The Septuagint adds 1,012 years to the timing of the flood. That means that instead of the flood occurring 2348 BC, it occurred in 3360 BC. Likewise, it adds almost 1600 years to the date when Yahweh created Adam and Eve. My calculated date, which corresponds closely with many, many others, identifies Adam and Eve's creation circa 5616 BC, rather than the familiar 4004 BC. Next, and lastly, this all matters because once we add back all these years, 
it reshapes, sometimes dramatically, the great stories of Genesis 1 through 11. When did the flood occur? When did the Tower of Babel happen after the flood? Who led the rebellion at the time of the tower? Would you be surprised to learn that Nimrod was not likely born until at least 100 years after the Tower of Babel event? Recall, Genesis 11 tells us about this occurrence, but there is no mention of Nimrod. His name is conspicuously absent in chapter 11, where the story of the tower is recorded. Next, we must underscore that when Peleg was born, the child supposedly born at the time of the division of the nations, well, it wasn't at that time that the Tower of Babel incident occurred. Peleg was born at least 300 years after the Tower of Babel event. So what then was the division spoken of in Genesis 11 when Peleg was born? Well, it wasn't the separation of nations based on language differences. That is the conventional view. But the Bible doesn't exactly say this is what was meant by Peleg's name meaning division. Instead, as we'll talk more about, it meant a separation by waters, as we will soon see. Well, it's actually the book of Jasher that gets us off track. It was likely historical fiction produced about the time near the creation of the Gutenberg Press in the 15th century. Jasher tells us wrongly that the division of languages is what Peleg means, and so does Josephus, by the way, based on Hebrew legends. But the chronology informs us that this could not have been what the separation encoded in Peleg's name actually means. In fact, Jasher is quite misleading. For instance, the book of Jasher asserts 14 points about Babel, but only one of them is in the Bible. The rest are made up. When you investigate the details of the story, as I have in Rebooting the Bible Part 2, you see that it confuses what the characters did and when they did it, that is, if they did it at all. Nimrod is the prime example. Unfortunately, Jasher's account is what we have accepted as the historical truth about Babel, and this misleads us. Recall, Nimrod is only mentioned in four verses in the Bible, and three of those verses are identical. Thus, there are only two statements about Nimrod. The rest is legend. Yes, legends have made the truth about Babel nearly impossible to determine. Therefore, we must separate the truth from the legends. And by the way, we should also make special note that the flood was 1,000 years before Abraham and about 800 years after the Babel Rebellion. Do you realize that Egypt's great dynasties and its pyramids had been built at least 600 years before Abraham's entrance into Egypt? When Abraham went to Egypt, he saw the pyramids and the Sphinx. Egypt likely had been in existence as a unique nation-state for almost a thousand years. The question we should keep in the back of our minds, when the Bible describes the Tower of Babel event in Genesis 11, where is the mention of Nimrod or his leading the rebellion? Well, in fact, that leader is just not disclosed. Instead, we read third-person plural subjects, such as we and they, in other words, the Bible asserts that there was no one person at fault. Instead, everyone agreed and was in full rebellion. We won't stop to read chapter 11 of Genesis right now, but trust me, Nimrod isn't mentioned once. Instead, we will analyze the statements in the book of Jasher regarding the Tower event, and we will see that almost everything we've been told about the Tower of Babel and Nimrod is not what the Bible teaches us. It was what the fictional book of Jasher makes up. The incident occurred in 1988 Anumundi, which means from the beginning of the world, which is approximately 2,000 years after Adam was created, which would put it at about 2016-2012 BC. Now the Septuagint contradicts this chronology significantly. 
The event occurred after Abraham had lived with Noah for 39 years. Again, the Septuagint contradicts this chronology. Humanity was already caught up in idolatry, worshiping the sun and moon, and made stones and wood their gods. Nimrod reigned securely, and all the earth was under his control, using one tongue and words of union. It was not all of humanity, however, that rebelled against Yahweh. It was the princes of Nimrod and Put, Misrain, and Canaan, the Hamites, along with Nimrod being a special son of Cush, his father. Okay, so far these points are all from Jasher alone. Now we enter into an area where the Bible does confirm something. Then the rationale, come let us build ourselves a city and in it a strong tower and its top reaching heaven. And we will make ourselves famed so that we may reign upon the whole earth in order that the evil of our enemies may cease from us, that we may reign mightily over them, and that we may not become scattered over the earth on account of their wars. Back to Jasher. 600,000 men gathered to build a city and the tower. And then even more fantastic details are supplied, which is where many erroneous beliefs arise about the tower, the men who built it, and the God who created humankind. Quoting from the book of Jasher, it's chapter 9, And when they were building, they built themselves a great city and a very high and strong tower, and on account of its height, the mortar and bricks did not reach the builders in their ascent to it, until those who went up had completed a full day, excuse me, year, a full day, and after that they reached to the builders and gave them the mortar and the bricks. Thus it was done daily. And behold, these ascended and others descended the whole day. And if a brick should fall from their hands and get broken, they would all weep over it. And if a man fell and died, none of them would look at him. And the Lord knew their thoughts. And it came to pass, when they were building, they cast the arrows toward the heavens. And all the arrows fell upon them filled with blood. And when they saw them, they said to each other, Surely we have slain all those that are in heaven. End quote. And continuing, God descended with seventy angels, from which the seventy nations are distinguished and assigned, and confused their tongue. The mass of humanity began to fight one another, and many died. Then God judged the three divisions of rebels, the first that asserted they would ascend to the heavens, becoming like apes and elephants, the second that pledged to shoot arrows and kill God, and the third that proclaimed they would ascend to heaven to fight against him. The Lord scattered most, but not all, for those who remained amongst them, when they knew and understood the evil which was coming upon them, they forsook the building, and they also became scattered upon the face of the whole earth. And then we'll throw in one statement that is in the Bible. They ceased building the city and the tower. Thus the Lord confounded the language of the whole earth. Then more astounding details are provided that add to the mythical quality of the story of the book of Jasher. And as to the tower which the sons of men built, the earth opened its mouth and swallowed up one-third part thereof, and a fire also descended from heaven and burned another third. And the other third is left to this day, and it is of that part which was aloft, and its circumference is three days' walk. And many of the sons of men died in that tower, a people without number. Again, <laughs> comments from the book of Jasher. Only one is found in the Bible. So let me summarize. Jasher makes 14 compound assertions about the Tower of Babel incident. The Bible confirms only one aspect in two of the assertions. The rest, it's historical fiction. It's interesting, but it's untrue, and it's very misleading. We are easily swayed into believing it because we would love to learn more about these mysterious years. But recall, quote, the Bible on Nimrod, only four verses exist, and three of them are repetitive, i.e., they're really the same verse. Let's look at that. 
as you can see, the four verses are Genesis 10.8, Genesis 10.9, 1 Chronicles 1.10, and then Micah 5.6. And essentially, the verse is, Cush begat Namrad, Nimrod, he began to be a mighty one in the earth. And he was a mighty hunter before the Lord, wherefore it is said, even as Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord. All right, and then in Micah 5, 6, And they shall waste the land of Assyria with a sword, and the land of Nimrod in the entrances thereof. Thus shall he deliver us from the Assyrian, when he cometh into our land, and when he treadeth within our borders. And of course, that could be a very interesting prophecy about the coming, the second coming of the Son of God. But there is more to the story of Nimrod and the first global empire. For the analysis shows that Nimrod was likely too young to have been the leader of the rebellion. Cush, his father, likely led his clan along with Canaan's clan to build the first version of the Tower of Babylon. Cush, then Nimrod, both attempted to reverse Noah's curse on Ham's lineage. Nimrod came almost 100 years later, after likely conquering North and Eastern Africa, to take control of southern Iraq and Syria. The path to Nimrod's empire is most likely a story of intrigue, betrayal, and perhaps even the murder of his brothers. We know that Cush and his sons fled south to what is today's Ethiopia after the Tower of Babel incident. When they arrived in Central Africa, the family of Cush may have sought the lands of Mizraim, that's Egypt, and Put, or Libya. Nimrod was likely born somewhere early in the occupation of Ethiopia. I speculate that Nimrod determined to first take North Africa by stealing it from his brothers. There are many legends about Nimrod giving rise to the first dynasty of Egypt around 3000 BC. He may well be the first Egyptian king or pharaoh. According to history, the first king, Menes, took control of Upper and Lower Egypt about 3150 BC. Now my date would be about 200 years later or closer to 3000 BC. Menes would determine to return to the Levant to take control of the lands denied Cush conquering Samaria, that's lower Mesopotamia, and then build the cities of Assyria, most notably Nineveh. In Sumeria, he would adopt the name in Marcar, along with his other names. Other legends say that Nimrod went north towards Mount Ararat in Armenia, and then east towards the Indus Valley in India. Nimrod's empire did reverse Noah's curse on Ham, that had fallen on Canaan and his father Cush. For three millennia, the Hamites generally dominated the area from the Black Sea to the Persian Gulf and from the Mediterranean to the Caspian Sea. Eventually, however, with the defeat of Babylon circa 539 BC, the Medes and the Persians, possibly Aryans from the lineage of Japheth, would control the region for about 200 years until Alexander the Great defeated Darius circa September the 30th, 331 BC at the Battle of Gagamela. So, the division of the earth. This is a major factor in the progression of humanity's existence on this earth. The theories all seem radical and are extremely varied. The first involves the supernatural confusion of languages at the Tower of Babel. But there are reasons, even from Genesis, its record in chapter 10, to question the traditional story. The languages may have been confused by the action of Yahweh. However, there are other possibilities that don't conflict with the Bible's record. The second theory suggests that for a variety of reasons, most notably global catastrophes, the Earth's crust was split and the continents were pulled apart by various tectonic forces, creating an upheaval with enormous quantities of waters rising from beneath the crust, i.e. 
the mantle. In this theory, continental drift didn't happen over millions of years, but perhaps in less than one year. The writings of Emanuel Velikovsky in his books Worlds in Collision and In the Beginning detail what forces could have caused this crustal split, and he points out meticulously copious ancient records that support his theory. And then the third point, we know that Peleg was not born until perhaps 300 years after the Babel event. The statement in scripture that at his birth the earth was divided is again is usually interpreted that this division was the division of languages. But if he was born 300 years after the event, his name must have meant something else. So look more closely at the map. The map shown here points out that Peleg's name and various derivations of that name are recorded in history across the Aegean and the Mediterranean seas. An incredible separation involving geography had to happen by his day, but there is still more to the story. Could the melting of the massive ice cap that had accumulated through ice ages and supplemented by ice produced by the flood, could it have been the cause? There are many geophysical stories that tell of the inundation of lands all over the world after the Great Flood by the dramatic rise of waters. Velikovsky talks of vast forests being buried around the world off the coasts of the continents. It seems having coastal or seafront property has always been desirable. It is conceivable that the water rose over 400 feet bury numerous civilizations lying near the coast, where many typically locate. And this catastrophe created great distances of seas and oceans between the lands all around the world. Now, we can't be dogmatic what it was, but it wasn't primarily the division of languages. The correct timeline proves that understanding is not what the Bible is saying. And just so you know, the chapter in Rebooting the Bible 2 that discusses this single verse about Peleg is almost 40 pages in length. Why so much time and effort devoted to it? Well, to align the Bible with legitimate science such as archaeology and the evolution of language, the emphasis is central to getting the Bible story right. And one of our overarching goals in Rebooting the Bible is to make sense of the Bible so that those that do not believe in it may have cause to believe. Now we must turn to how we know the witness of the Septuagint is true. Well this slide, it's busy, and it presents a timeline of the creation of the respective Vorlogs. Okay, what is a Vorlog? Well, consider it the master copy from which all other copies are created. When I was at Microsoft, once we had a software package ready to go, it would be placed on a gold disk, and the gold disk would become the master copy from which all other software disk on CD would be made. And we should note that the Septuagint is created 400 years earlier than the Masoretic text, the MT Vorlog. Again, that MT is the Masoretic text. This family line of biblical texts forms the basis for the Protestant and Catholic Bibles, but not the Orthodox Bible, which has always remained the Septuagint. Using the Masoretic text proves to be a gross mistake. We must chalk up to Jerome, who came up with the Catholic Bible, circa AD 395, and the Reformers, Calvin, Luther, who translated the Hebrew into common languages of the 16th century. Now, the oldest existing or extant copy of the Septuagint Vorlog exists in three distinct codices. And a codice is a book where pages are, in effect, tied together as opposed to scrolls. These codices are dated to the 3rd and 4th centuries AD. These codices have names, and they are known as the Alexandrian, the Vatican, the Vatican or Vaticanus, and Sinai codices when the names are anglicized. The oldest existing copies of the Masoretic text vorlog come much later. They are the Aleppo Codex, 
about 890 AD, and the Leningrad Codex from 1008 AD. So that's the 9th and 10th centuries, or roughly 1,200 or and 1,000 years ago, respectively. Thus, the Septuagint, known as the Christian Bible, according to the rabbis, can tie our Bibles to codices 600 years older than the Masoretic Text codices. So the point, the Septuagint was created 400 years before the beginning of the Masoretic Text, the Proto-MT, and our copies of it, which there are three, are 600 years older than the Masoretic Text. The Septuagint has much stronger empirical evidence that it reflects the original, authentic Hebrew, much more so than, surprisingly, the Hebrew Masoretic Text. Okay, now that we know what a Vorlog is, let's summarize. First, Ezra assembles the Hebrew Bible during his time after returning from Babylon. His work is complete approximately 420 BC. Tradition tells us that three master copies would then be stored in the temple. Ptolemy I, the Greek general cum Pharaoh, requests assistance from the Hebrew high priest to complete a translation of the Hebrew law, that is, the Pentateuch, into Greek from Ezra's master copy. Koine Greek, that is, not Attic or Classical Greek. This is the same form of Greek as the New Testament, hence its easy adoption, and this is Common Greek, written for the common man, not the elites. Third, the Greek forelog of the Pentateuch, and possibly Joshua, Judges, and Ruth, are created and made available to the library and Jewish community in Egypt by 280 BC or thereabouts. At this point, it is four centuries, that is 400 years before the Hebrew Old Testament will be re-engineered by post-temple rabbis in what we call the Proto-Masoretic Text. This is the same length of time from when the pilgrims landed at P Plymouth Rock all the way to today. Hmm. You know, a lot can happen in four centuries. Just consider America's entire history happens in four centuries. The remainder of the Septuagint is finished about 135 BC, about 150 years after it was begun. Perhaps the most critical book debated among scholars, scholars as it relates to the time when it was translated is the book of Daniel. When was it created and translated? Some argue it was indeed written by Daniel, that's what I believe, but it, but it wasn't codified until Ezra, and it wasn't in Greek form, until the 2nd century BC. Well, that shouldn't be a problem. But it is for modern scholars because the book holds prophecies that are evidence of the supernatural, and they dismiss the supernatural. Next, the book of Maccabees were originally written in Greek, not Hebrew. And note, the books of the Apocrypha, included in the Septuagint, are also created by this date. The books we call Pseudepigrapha are not necessarily completed by this time, but may be created even later. The books Enoch and Jubilees were created in this time frame. Jasher won't be created, in my opinion, for another 1,500 years, likely in the time of Gutenberg, as I stated earlier. The apostles will rely upon the Septuagint, citing at 80 to 90 percent of the time in their epistles and likely in their sermons as they were speaking to a world that had a common language, which was Greek. It is likely that Jesus also learned the Septuagint and quoted it since his audience was familiar with it and likely his audience only had a very cursory knowledge of Hebrew. Of course, I believe that Jesus knew every word of the Hebrew and Greek and his exegesis, well, it, it was perfect. Justinian, the emperor of the Eastern Roman Empire at Constantinople, would make the Septuagint official as the Bible of the Eastern Roman Church around AD 532, five centuries after the death and resurrection of Christ. Origen's Hexapla, a six-column interlinear Bible, would blend in some of the words used by the two Jewish converts, Symmachus and Theodosian, who followed Akiba's Hebrew version. 
and they base their Greek translation on the Hebrew proto-Masoretic text, i.e. not the Septuagint. The changes altered the original, and its origins hexaplaric version that is used in the Eastern Church to this day. Well, despite that fact, the Septuagint is still held by scholars who study it to be more accurate to the original Hebrew than the Masoretic in most all cases. And the Septuagint texts from the Dead Sea Scrolls also help us pinpoint the authentic Alexandrian Greek Bible, that is, the original. On the right is a picture of a leaf from Codex Sinaiticus, believed to have been scribed not later than AD 330, and perhaps as early as AD 260. And, and do note, we have New Testament fragments and some complete books on papyrus from two centuries earlier than these complete or almost complete codices. These fragments, like the Chester Beatty papyrus, oftentimes date within just a few decades of the originals penned by the apostles. Well, so how important was the Septuagint to other Bibles? The Septuagint became the basis for other language translations of the Old Testament into Coptic, Syriac, and Armenian. And now it wasn't until AD 395, as I stated earlier, that Jerome completed a Latin version, translated mostly from the corrupted Hebrew version of Rabbi Akiva. Then, by the 6th century, Latin became the dominant spoken and written language of the Bible in Western Europe. But Greek continued to dominate in Africa, Eastern Europe, and Asia Minor, namely Turkey, and more specifically Antioch. Speaking of Jerome and the Vulgate, about the time that Jerome was completing the Vulgate, that's about 395 AD, Augustine wrote an open letter to Jerome that apparently Jerome did not read and didn't respond to for at least 10 years. Augustine's opinion was that the Greek translation was the Bible for the church. Now, I don't have time to read Jerome's defense of his decision to translate into Latin from the Hebrew but his decision was most likely due to his arrogance, his having learned Hebrew, which was something that almost no other church patriarch knew in his day. Jerome defended his right to go with Hebrew and didn't directly respond to all of Augustine's allegations in Augustine's letter dated AD 394. Because no other church scholars knew Hebrew, Jerome's Latin version was generally without critics in the Western Roman church. Well, but allow me to read just a portion from Augustine's letter to Jerome, pleading with him to continue to rely upon the Septuagint rather than the Hebrew of Akiba to serve as the basis for a new Latin version. Quote, I beseech you not to devote your labor to the work of translating into Latin the sacred canonical books, unless you follow the method in which you have translated Job, that is, with the addition of notes, to let it be seen plainly what differences there are between this version of yours and that of the Septuagint, whose authority is worthy of highest esteem. Well, for my own part, I cannot sufficiently express my wonder that anything should at this date be found in the Hebrew manuscripts which escaped so many translators perfectly acquainted with the language. Well, I say nothing of the Seventy, regarding whose harmony in mind and spirit, surpassing that which is found in even one man, I dare not in any way pronounce a decided opinion, except that, in my judgment, beyond question, very high authority must, in this work of translation, be conceded to them. All of this material is contained in two monster books that I have written over the past few years. A shout out to scientist Barry Setterfield for opening my eyes to the Septuagint about five years ago. By the way, you can find Barry's site at barrysetterfield.org. I highly recommend it. Setterfield is spelled S-E-T-T-E-R-F-I-E-L-D, barrysetterfield.org. To me, the amazing thing about my books is not that I uncovered this information from scratch. I didn't. I've just compiled the work of many others and packaged it for the layperson. Admittedly, I have put a point on it to create wider awareness. I believe Catholics and Protestants ought to know about the history of their Bibles and how they were based on a corrupted, at least partly corrupted, Old Testament. This isn't something that is taught, and while there are those who know about the Septuagint, they haven't been willing to go on record and expose the fact 
that there was a rabbinic conspiracy in the first and second centuries, and that the changes they made made a huge difference on how we understand our Old Testament, the reasons we can trust Jesus was the Messiah, and why there are discrepancy in Messianic passages and the Genesis chronologies that were inserted to misinform Catholics and Protestants on where the authentic witness to the authentic Hebrew can truly be found, which is the Septuagint. So let's drill down a bit into the conspiracy. Well, these are the facts. Akiba is the principal character. It turns out that the Pharisees morphed themselves into the rabbis after the temple was destroyed in 70 AD. They also came to call themselves sages. The old Greek Septuagint was shunned in the Jewish synagogues by around AD 100. By then, the rabbis considered the Septuagint the Christian Bible. A revised Hebrew Bible was created, what we could term the proto-Masoretic text, as I've mentioned it before. From the viewpoint of the rabbis, those passages that could be too easily interpreted to point to Jesus of Nazareth, well, they had to be changed. This recension, that is, a revised edition of the Hebrew text, was completed sometime before A.D. 120 at the Rabbinic School in Jamnia. The dramatic development is the writing down of the so-called Oral Law. This is the Mishnah, and it is considered laws that can supersede the Bible. The Mishnah is something like the Book of Mormon. It is extra-biblical text that supposedly expands on the Bible but it is not acceptable to those who believe that the Hebrew Old Testament was completed when Ezra compiled it. The original is authoritative. The Mishnah is in effect what Jesus was battling against. So let's look at some of the evidence that changes were made. Here are just a few. Reading the English translation of the Old Testament, first from the English Standard Version, ESV, then Britain's Septuagint, which was translated around 1851, if memory serves, and finally the King James Version, which reflects the Masoretic text, the corrupted Hebrew translated into English in 1611. Let's look at Hebrews 10.5 and compare it with Psalms 40, verse 6. In Hebrews, the ESV, Consequently, when Christ came into the world, he said, Sacrifices and offerings you have not desired, but a body have you prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sin offerings you have taken no pleasure. What does the Septuagint say in Psalms 46? Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body thou hast prepared me. Whole burnt offering and sacrifice for sin thou didst not require. And the King James Version, does it say the same thing? Sacrifice and offering thou didst not desire, mine ears hast thou opened. Burnt offering and sin offering hast thou not required. Okay, let's look at Matthew 12, 20, 21 with Isaiah 42, verse 4. In Matthew, the ESV, a bruised reed he will not break and a smoldering wick he will not quench until he brings justice to victory, and in this name the Gentiles will hope. The Septuagint says in Isaiah 42, verse 4, He shall shine out and shall not be discouraged until he hath set judgment on the earth, and in his name shall the Gentiles trust. But what does the King James Version say in Isaiah 42, 4? He shall not fail, nor be discouraged, till he hath set judgment in the earth, and the isles shall wait for his law. Now highlighting Luke 4.18 with Isaiah 61 verse 1. The ESV in Luke. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed. And the Septuagint, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me. He has sent me to preach glad tidings to the poor, to heal the broken in heart, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and recovery of sight to the blind. 
the King James Version, Isaiah 61, 1. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings upon the meek. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound. All right, let's look at Hebrews 1, 6 with Deuteronomy 32, 43. The ESV, Hebrews 1, 6. And again, when he brings the firstborn into the world, he says, let all God's angels worship him. The Septuagint in Deuteronomy says, Rejoice ye heavens with him, and let all the angels of God worship him. Rejoice ye Gentiles with his people, and let all the sons of God strengthen themselves in him. For he will avenge the blood of his sons, and he will render vengeance and recompense justice to his enemies, and will reward them that hate him, and the Lord shall purge the land of his people. But the King James Version in Deuteronomy 32:43 says, Rejoice, O you nations, with his people, for he will avenge the blood of his servants, and he will render vengeance to his adversaries, and will be merciful unto his land and unto his people. Obviously omitting the phrase about the angels worshiping him and the Gentiles rejoicing in him. So why does it matter? Well, first, it matters because we should attempt to resolve any apparent contradictions between the Old and New Testaments. And when we look at the Old Testament verses cited in the New, we see they often do not say the same thing. We need to understand why this is so. Now, secondly, because the Bible's timeline conflicts greatly with the timeline of secular archaeology, we need to look at this. From an apologetic standpoint, we need to do this to better defend the veracity of the Bible. So, we do need to delve into this matter. Recall the most well-known biblical chronology was created by Bishop James Usher around A.D. 1640. His timeline is driven primarily by the chronologies of Genesis 5 and 11, as translated in the King James Bible of 1611, almost 30 years before Usher published his chronology. But the sticking point is that there are enormous differences in dates and times between what the Bible says and what Mesopotamian archaeology and Egyptology say. Usher's timeline suggests the flood happened in 2348 BC. Surprisingly, archaeology now seems to affirm there was in fact a great flood, although perhaps it was only regional in scope, despite many academics, including theologians, willing to only to accept a regional flood. This will not explain why there is unassailable evidence that almost every people in the world have a flood story that reflects at least some of what the Bible's account of the flood states. Nevertheless, the flood took place sometime before the founding of the great city of Ur in southern Samaria, which archaeologists date to about 3100 BC. Likewise, Egypt's first dynasty is also dated to about 3000 BC. Then India follows suit, asserting its history began about 3102 BC, while China seems to imply its history commenced about 2800 BC. If the flood happened and life began again, the flood must have happened several hundred years before these civilizations say their history began. In other words, if all these civilizations state that they began about the same time, why does the Bible date the flood 1,000 years after these civilizations that virtually agree with one another as to when their respective histories began? This is a vital point. The timing from all these great regions is aligned. History begins about 3100 BC. If so, why does the Hebrew Bible state the post-flood world began again in 2348 BC? This is an enormous mistake that has caused untold errors in Christianity's testimony for almost 1,500 years. Now, I wouldn't say 2,000 years because for the first 500 years, the church follows the Septuagint's account. Well, let's contrast the two chronologies, the Septuagint from the Masoretic text. So, if we look more closely at the pre-flood world, the antediluvian ages, we see that there's 606 years difference from the two chronologies, concluding at the date of the flood, 3660 BC or 2256 Anno Mundi, that's the same date, 
in the longer chronology of the Septuagint. Look at the center column. In the MT, there had been about 1,662 years from creation, supposedly in 4004 BC, and 2348 BC in the chronology for the Great Flood of Noah. But the Septuagint asserts that Adam was created circa 5616 BC, well in my calculation, which is 606 years earlier. And note, those who affirm the Septuagint's timelines all assert the beginning of Genesis 1, 2, and beyond to be about 5,500 years before Christ's birth. Note, the yellow squares illustrate that there are some differences of opinion on the timings related to Lamech and Bethuselah. Well, the variance here is perhaps six years, scribal errors, errors in transmission, but they're small potatoes. They really don't contradict the point we're making. Well, the reason why the chronology was changed was specifically to dismiss the claim of Jesus of Nazareth and his disciples that he was the expected Messiah. In the days of Jesus, tradition held that the Messiah would come sometime in the sixth millennium, at least 5,000 years from Adam. Well, more will be said of this in the next portion of this presentation, but we'll break here and we'll create a second or part two of the story. Thanks for your attention.